question. At this particular moment of late modernity, the end of the 20th century, the rise of globalization, what's going on? Now, I have a whole set of hypotheses out of the books that Tim has talked about, including Terror in the Mind of God. Now, in its fourth edition, which will be out in a few months, uh, look for it at better bookstores everywhere. <laughs> uh, and in general, my thesis is kind of this. We're in an era of globalization, and it's not by any coincidence that these movements of religious violence and ethnic nationalism are on a virtually global scale, because it seems to me globalization is a part of the problem. And when the whole idea of the nation state based on community, based on ethnic and religious homogeneity is undercut by the radical changes of globalization, and by that I mean not just uh, demographic shifts where everybody can live everywhere and do, uh, but also economic shifts, which is so much a part of, the, of this year's election. We've been talking about that, that we really are uh, seeing a kind of rise of xenophobia and a kind of ethnic and and religious nationalism in this country, which is mirrored all over the world. It's part of Brexit. It's part of the rise of new right-wing parties in Australia, uh, Austria and in, in France. Uh, Duterte, the new, uh, new president of the Philippines, another kind of strong man, Al-Sisi in Egypt, uh, uh, Erdogan in Turkey. This is a global phenomenon. phenomenon. We're in an era of globalization, people look to a kind of resurgence of uh, identities that would make viable uh, a vision of a past that probably never quite existed, uh, but they feel under threat in, an era, in the global era. So I'm prepared to talk about that in general, but what I'd like to talk about specifically is ISIS, because this is a movement that's been very much in my uh, thinking and uh, in my research in the last uh, couple years, and today it's more than just a matter of thinking but it's also a matter of what's going on in, uh, in Iraq itself. And apparently I have to be close to the computer in order to make it click. Uh, you, Tim, you promised me that this would, thing would click. Uh, where's Tim? He's gone. I knew he would take off in a minute. I needed him. All right, forget this thing. I'll have to stay here and do it this way. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is Mosul. And, and this is Mosul two days ago. Things that are moving very quickly on the ground. Uh, yesterday, the, the, uh, the city walls were breached. Uh, uh, forces, and there's a combination of forces, uh, Iraq army, uh, Sunni tribal forces, Shia militia, uh, Peshmerga from, um, from Kurdistan, uh, Kurdish forces. Uh, groups are kind of united with American coordination and American airstrikes to uh, uh, give support for the groups. They finally moved into uh, this, area from the east. This is the, the road to Herbal down here. And then Mosul's over here, and they managed to move from, I don't think we can see it very clearly, but this is where the old border used to be, between ISIS-held territory and Kurdistan. And now they've moved all the way into the inside of the city. And it's a matter of, I don't know, maybe weeks, maybe months, uh, maybe sooner than that, if ISIS just turns tail and, and flees, but there are at least 5,000 of them hunkered down, and they're using humans, as, uh, the people, the citizens of Mosul as human shields. Uh, hard to tell how long it will take before Mosul fall, but it will fall. Now, one of the reasons I'm interested in all of this is, and I'm pointing to this map, this is kind of the border between uh, isis held territory and Kurdistan, and I was here just last year. And the reason I was there just last year is that they told you I was interested in ISIS and I, the old sociological method of going and talking with people, which I've used to, for a lot of the other movements I've talked with. I've talked with people involved in Al-Qaeda and Hamas and, and earlier this year in the Myanmar with the radical Buddhists who were inciting riots against the Muslims. Uh, but in the case of ISIS, it's kind of hard to go and talk to the guys. So what I did instead was go and talk with refugees of ISIS. People who lived in that area right on the border who just fled ISIS-controlled territory uh, and were now living in refugee camps in the area between Erbil and, uh, and Mosul. And the reason why I want to talk with them is because they had stayed, many of them had stayed in the villages after it was taken over by ISIS, and they had a pretty good sense of who these people were. And one of the questions I wanted to 
know for them is who are they <laughs> and what and what was the, what was their deal and this guy described ISIS as, as a strange religion he says it's nothing it's not like the Islam we know these are foreigners primarily these are people from from the outside who've come in and uh, we don't understand their deal then now he said there are some of the local people like this guy in particular he was a used car salesman in a town right near Mosul and he uh, had sold a used car to a guy who then had joined the ISIS army. So when the ISIS rounded up all the men and took over the side uh, outside of the, of the village and kind of gave them an ultimatum to either join ISIS or, uh, uh, or they would be killed, and this guy pretended to join ISIS before he took off, he saw one of the, the guy that he had sold the used car to. And when the other people left, he said, what are you doing here? And the guy looked kind of sheepish and he said, well, you know, I needed the money. And he said, well, why didn't you join the Iraq army? He said, you're not, a, you're not radically religious, you're not a supporter of ISIS. He said, no, no. He says, but he says the Iraq army only pays $500 a month and ISIS uh, pays $1,000 a month. And he says, they pay in American dollars. Wow. They got the American dollars, of course, from selling oil to Turkey. <laughs> and so, so clearly, they were there for opportunistic reasons. And others, he said, were there for political reasons. He said, after all, the, the Sunnis, and he was a Sunni himself, he said, we Sunnis have been disenfranchised, you know, under the Shiite government of Baghdad. And, you know, they, ISIS has given us a role, has given us some sort of power. So it became clear to me that the story of ISIS was really rooted in a different story, a, a story that goes back to the beginning of the Iraq War. The liberation, remember shock and awe when the Bush administration thought that it would just be a matter of days that you would kind of move in really quickly and you'd take over and there'd be the fall of, of Saddam Hussein and then suddenly everything would be liberated. And after all, Saddam Hussein was a secular leader and Iraq was a secular government, so a secular nation, in fact. So as soon as you topple this dictator, you could quickly put in a different kind of government and it would still continue to be a bastion of secular democracy within the Middle East. That was the idea. Going to happen really quickly, mission accomplished, tippy-toe in, tippy-toe out. Eh, that didn't happen. What happened, of course, was enormous instability within the country, a kind of collapse of infrastructure, People with whom I talked were just horrified at what, what, what was going on and how the, how the country was, was falling apart in, 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 in an era where they saw whatever structure Saddam Hussein had given to them, as much as they hated him, at least, you know, he held the country together. But when he was gone, the whole thing collapsed. But what I was interested in finding out, and the reason why I went there in the midst of this violence, in the midst of this turmoil, uh, right after the American invasion and occupation of Iraq at the end of 2003. And the reason why I went there in early 2004 was to try to figure why it had become such a religious insurgency. I can understand why people objected to the occupation. They felt, may have felt that the U.S. had bungled it. But why this extraordinary religious passion with which, particularly in al Anbar province in western Iraq, the Sunni young people uh, were following a kind of religious cause into uh, wanting to uh, get back at the Americans. And so I talked with this guy, explain who these people are. On, on the left of the screen next to me is Mary Calder, my colleague from London School of Economics. And Mary and I were invited there by a humanitarian, a women's humanitarian organization in Baghdad at Baghdad University to look at the reconstruction of a rock society after the uh, after the invasion and, and uh, the, the political transfer after uh, uh, Saddam Hussein. The woman on the right is our uh, translator, and the guy in the middle is the one of the heads of the Association of Muslim Clerics of Al Anbar Province, the leading Sunni organization of Western Iraq, and the people who are behind the insurgency against the Americans. So he was the guy I wanted to talk with. And so I said, you know, what's, what's the deal? I mean, are you, are you supporters of Saddam Hussein? He said, no, are you out of your mind? He said, we, Saddam Hussein hated us. He was a secular socialist. He couldn't stand religious people. He says, no, he says, you know, we, we've, we've given this a lot of thought. He said, no, we've, we've figured out why you Americans came to Iraq. 
that toppled Saddam Hussein and to take over the country. And I said, well, tell me, because a lot of Americans are wondering the same thing. <laughs> what, what was it? Is it about oil? I said, no, it wasn't about oil. It wasn't about weapons of mass destruction. We knew that Saddam didn't have these things. He was trying to scare us the way he always had, ruled by intimidation and fear, claimed that he had power that he didn't have. No, no. No, we knew he was a weak. He, we knew he was weak and about to fall. And that's why the Americans had to come and take over. Because, you know, Saddam Hussein was an American puppet. Oh, really? No, I didn't know that. Oh, yes, yes. We all, everybody here knows that. You know, he was a puppet of the CIA. You know, he looked during, you know, the Iraq war, Iraq, uh, uh, Iran war. I said, oh, yes, I remember. You know, Rumsfeld was a, was, was, a, 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 was a friend of his at that time, and they, you know, was support, we were, cause that's because we were supporting Iran. Yes, yes, Saddam was an American puppet. And I said, okay, then why would, why would the U.S. then want to come in and destroy Saddam Hussein and run the country if he was an American puppet? And he looked at me as if he was talking to a small child, and he said, well, don't you get it? Says so, uh, we knew, everybody knew he was weak, including the Americans, and he was about to fall to the Islamic Revolution. And that's what the Americans didn't want. They didn't want an Islamic Revolution in the Middle East, so they had to come in and run the country themselves. Their puppet was no longer powerful. He was about to fall. And that's what the Americans have done, and they've given the country to the Shia. As Sunnis now no longer have the possibility to create an Islamic Revolution, but we will, we will succeed. You Americans said, will not win because Islam will prevail. What an extraordinary <laughs> vision. So I said, well, this is the weirdest conspiracy theory I've ever heard. So I started talking with other people in Baghdad and you know, other areas of Iraq. And they said, yeah, yeah, we believe that. Yeah, we think that's what the Americans are afraid of. They're afraid of the you know, Islamic power in the Middle East. At the time, I thought it was a wacky conspiracy theory. I began to think maybe they weren't so wacky after all. But contained in this was a great fear of what George Bush at the time was calling democracy. That is, majority rule. And majority rule meant Sunni, Sunni Muslims, Sunni Arabs are screwed. And they're screwed because we have to go back into history. At the end of the Ottoman Empire, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, World War, World War I, the end of World War I, there were no nation states. There were just different provinces of the Ottoman Empire. As you can see, there was a kind of crazy quilt that was kind of followed vaguely ethnic boundaries. But when the British and French decided, as John Stewart in The Daily Show has a character called Sir Maps a lot, who <laughs> would just come and start drawing lines uh, arbitrarily across the sand. Oh, here's Iraq, here's Syria, here's Jordan. No, oh, we'll move this one around. It was almost that bad. The problem is that they had to create nation states. They felt like they had to have nation states. And so, well, uh, with Syria, we'll create that. And we'll, let's see, there's a chunk over there. There are a lot of Christians. Well, let's make that separate. We'll make that Lebanon. The area on the other side of the Jordan, let's call that Transjordan. That's this Jordan. Hey, we have to uh, protect the Holy Land. We'll call that Israel. Let's see, what else? Well, there's all this area left over, over this chunk over there. Let's all put it together and call it a rock, which they did. So you have three different ethnic communities configured by both ethnicity and religion. You have Sunnis on the left and Shia on the right. And on the left, the Sunnis are divided between Sunni Arabs over there in the Al-Anbar region and Sunni Kurds up here. Ethnicity is stronger than religion. Kurds and Arabs really don't get along at all. But even among these Arabs, Sunni and Shia, they don't get along too well either. The Shia, of course, influenced by Iran, are saying, oh yes, they're just like the Persians. No, they're not, because the Persians are ethnically Persian. <laughs> and the, and the, uh, the, the Arab Sunnis in Iraq are Arabs. They speak Arabic, they're really quite different. But the preponderance of people, 60% of the population are Shia. And democracy means Shia are in power, Kurds and Sunnis, tough luck. And that's what they were fighting for. And that's, by the way, what they're still fighting for. If you understand that, you understand what's going on right now. Because soon after, I, in fact, while I was there, along comes this guy, 
Palestinian who lived in Jordan by the name of Al-Zakari, had tattoos, he was kind of a thug, sold drugs in the streets of Oman, but he had this vision of Sunni power. So he comes riding in and he creates, uh, you know, a tough-minded kind of, uh, sort of, Zakari has a, almost a Wahhabi sensibility about how to, how to originally run a, a society by very rigorous medieval uh, Islamic codes, including uh, you know, decapitation if, in, if necessary, chop their heads off, look familiar, orange drums, yes, this was going on at the time of Zakari when I was there in 2004. And at that time, this was, uh, this was the tough, extreme element of Sunni Arab nationalism. And he called himself Al-Qaeda in, in, in Iraq. He used the name Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was yeah, a little suspicious of this guy. His really anti-Shia thing was kind of overboard, but what the hell, it made them look like they were stronger than they actually were. Okay, we'll accept this as a franchise. We'll have Al-Qaeda in, in Iraq. And there was no real correlation between you know, Osama bin Laden and hiding out in Abbottabad in Pakistan and Al-Qaeda in Iraq. They were their own thing. They were fighting for Sunni power within Iraq. But they used the name. Zakari himself was killed. Uh, interesting mission. There's a lot of discussion about how he was found and caught. The U.S. military had to you know, show his dead head you know, in a picture for people actually except the fact that he was in fact killed. But killing Zakar didn't really kill the movement. The Al-Qaeda in Iraq movement continued, and it continued focusing on both Shia and on Americans and American military and creating hell for Americans in the western region of Iraq. And this is when an American general by the name of Petraeus got an extraordinarily, one of the few good ideas, good strategy in, in the Iraq war. And that was for the American military to get out of al Anbar province. In other words, to leave the area, to go to redirect the, the American troops to the city of Baghdad, where they could essentially police it. They would add some more American troops. This was called the surge at the time. It wasn't a surge in, in Al Anbar province. It was a surge in Baghdad, because Petraeus wanted to move the American troops out of Baghdad, where they were just creating you know, a cause for more rebellion and empower the Sunni tribals themselves to fight Zakari and Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Because the Sunni tribal leaders saw them as a threat, saw them as a competition. And so the Americans armed them, they gave them some kind of status, some role within the Iraq government. The Sunnis thought, oh, so we're not so marginalized after all. And this was called the Awakening, a movement that then was enormously effective in basically getting rid of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Zakari was gone. There was now a new guy who came into power, and then a, he was killed pretty soon, and along with a third guy by the name of Al Baghdadi. More about him in a second. But the story continues because the U.S. didn't stay there forever. The U.S. left Iraq in 2011. It was an agreement signed by the George Bush administration, which Obama carried out, didn't really have any choice. The leaders at the time, Al Maliki, had no use for Americans in, uh, in, in Iraq. And al-Maliki really had quite a different vision. This is my picture. I interviewed al-Maliki when I was there in 2004, actually before he became prime minister. And I gotta tell you, it's one of the most boring interviews I've ever had. I mean, the guy was like nothing. <laughs> you know, he just uh, kept on uttering platitudes. Oh yeah, Sunni and Shia are wonderful. We will all live together in peace and harmony. Yes, yes, yes. So, but as soon as he got into power, of course, it was a different matter. And by the way, he was put in power in part because he was a nevish. He was, I, I wanted to talk with the leader of the, of the major Shia party, but they wouldn't have any time for me. So this was like a, a second level of the Shia party, and he wasn't even the major guy, and he was like the office manager. And he, this is him coming out to see me. He had no receptionist, no staff. It was just all by himself in the office and we talked most of the afternoon. He was a nothing, which is why they liked him. Because they thought he would be a temporary placeholder as prime minister, he wasn't power hungry, and they could very quickly, you know, work out the politics and elect somebody who had a stronger standing to be the prime minister of 
Iraq. Well, uh, Maliki was a little bit craftier than they thought because he found a way to stay in power, and that was through patronage. And patronage to his Shia supporters. Take that Shia majority and give them positions in the army, no matter if they knew nothing about the army. Give them positions in government, give them positions in leadership. He built his base on Shia support, which made sense. They were the dominant community within Iraq. And what about the Sunnis? <laughs> Tough luck, Sunnis. Once again, they're treated like dirt. Once again, the Sunnis are marginalized. So poor Sunnis disaffected at the same time next door in Syria, all hell is breaking loose, and again it's the same people. It's the Sunnis in eastern Syria who feel left out of things. They feel in time of Arab Spring, they are rising up against the Shia government of Syria. Again, a very small group within Syria. Don't represent the majority of the country. Um, of course, in Iraq, the majority is Shia, but uh, in al Anbar province, the majority are Sunni. And they felt disenfranchised. And their neighbors, their compatriots, the same people, really, just across the border, you know, if the Sir Mapsalot had <laughs> drawn the boundaries differently, you know, eastern Syria and western Iraq would be part of the same country. So on, this, on the other side of the border, Syria is fighting against a Shia government. And once again, the old al in Iraq people figure, uh-huh, maybe, maybe we have a new base of operation. So into the picture comes this guy. Part of the old al in Iraq, he'd been like the number three or number four guy after the others were killed. Uh, this is a picture on the left of us when he was briefly arrested by the American government but they didn't have enough goods on him, and so, you know, he, 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 they let him go. But later on, he let his beard grow out a little bit, proclaimed himself the caliph of the world. You know, I'm the caliph of, <laughs> of the world, the new caliph, the new, you know, super king, starting with, starting with greater Syria. That's what al-Sham means. It's the second word of, uh, of ISIS, which is why it's off. And, which the French call the Levant, which is why it's often called ISIL rather than ISIS. Uh, actually, a more accurate uh, use, of, you know, translation of the of the Arabic. But he becomes, uh, you know, the caliph of this new movement. Uh, they discard the Al Qaeda in Iraq name because uh, the, the Al Qaeda people, Zawari, uh, sends a name and says, "Look, there's another Al Qaeda group called Al Nusra. You should be nice with them. You guys should work together." And Al Baghdadi says, well, that's to that. <laughs> we don't give a crap about Al Nusra. And we don't give a crap about you guys. We don't need this name, Al Qaeda. So they drop it, and they're just ISIS. Just, and then later, just the Islamic State. And just like the old al Zakari vision, they rule with a kind of Wahhabi and apocalyptic imagery about the world. The based in medieval kind of a subgroup within the Islamic tradition, not never a dominant part of Islam, but nonetheless enough to kind of give a ideological ferment and an ideological focus to a movement that gets its base in Syria in the ravages of civil war. They just hunker down and are able to control a large group, a bunch of territory, including a major city, Raqqa, and then like a Brits, Brits Krieg, <laughs> Brits, that's easy to say, isn't it? Blitz Krieg. They sweep over from Syria into Iraq, and eventually taking Mosul, um, Fallujah, some of the major cities of the, of the Sunni Arab regions of western Iraq, al Anbar, and Nineveh provinces. And that's basically where we are today. For the last two years, al-Qaeda in Iraq ruling kind of as a terrorist organization. And as horrible the pictures of decapitation, decapitation of, of journalists and, and other foreigners are, far more Iraqis have been killed the same way. There's a fence in the center of Mosul with spikes and heads have been placed on that spike regularly of those people who do not follow the wishes of ISIS. They use extreme measures as a way of controlling the populace extreme measures of, of, uh, of violence and cruelty, often carried out by these young foreigners that, that, that are encouraged to come and join the Great Revolution because Baghdadi knows he can control them. He knows that they don't know Arabic, they, they don't, they, they, they're totally beholden to him, 
and he can make them do whatever they he wants to do, like chopping people's heads off, no problem. Putting on a suicide belt, going into fighting against the enemy or fighting against their own uh, forces that might want to rebel, no problem. Because they're in a kind of imagined cosmic war. It's a wonderful resource for al-Baghdadi. And that's where we are today. But in a situation that's vastly changing. In the last, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the largest extent of, uh, of ISIS holdings, but this is a map from last year. And the red on this map, I don't know how well you can see it from the back of the room, but you can at least get a general idea. The red is land that used to be held by ISIS that was lost just this last year. And the only land that was gained is the green down here by Palmyra. That was last year. That green now is, is red. <laughs> the green now is no longer ISIS territory. Moreover, if they had the red on this map to expand, it would go all the way over to the top part of the map where the supply routes between the ISIS held territory and Turkey have been essentially broken. It also would move into major areas along here in Iraq. And of course, right now as we speak, the red areas would, would touch right into the city of Mosul. And then we would come back to the map that I just showed you at the outset where we are today, where ISIS looks like it's about to fall. And in the process, the liberation of the, some of the people I interviewed, including the guy in the first slide that you saw who had been in a village right next to Mosul, Probably the most touching people I interviewed who now are liberated are these women who were Yazidi, which is an ancient religion in Iraq, who lived in the, in the town of Sinjar and the area of Sinjar, uh, who were regarded as devil worshippers by the Muslims because it is a kind of it's a pre-Islamic nativist religion that has a lot of um, uh, astrology in a, is a part of it. They worship the sun, for example. Uh, so they're regarded as not really Muslim and therefore they can be used and abused in the most horrible of ways. And this lady is telling me in this picture about how she has, what she had to do to try to save her own daughters because her neighbor's daughters had been taken into sex slavery. And they've been taken out into a warehouse where they were literally auctioned off for a few dollars to, to old men, as she described it. And she was doing everything to protect her daughters, which she did, and she got them out. What an extraordinary, heroic story about how she had to steal out in the middle of the night and go through the forest, and finally she found the Kurdish forces that she could, uh, who would protect her. What an amazing and courageous story. Uh, and now she can go back to Sinjar. Well, could, but it has been destroyed. You know, there's just nothing there but rubble. And so for all of these refugees, they horrible situation of, yes, now you're free to go back, but free to go back in an area that's still, after all, in a war zone, and moreover uh, to towns that have been totally destroyed in the rubble, and they, it'll be some time before their lives can come back in any kind of uh, sensible way. But what then is going to happen to ISIS? Is ISIS over? Has ISIS ended? Well, it depends on what ISIS you're talking about. In an essay that I published this summer at the Cairo Review of, of uh, Global Affairs, I argue that there's really three different ISISs. And so the end of ISIS really depends on what ISIS you're talking about. Now, we talked a little bit about the Sunni supporters, but there is also this inner core, these people who are true believers in a kind of apocalyptic, visionary, uh, Islamic, uh, end of the world scenario where they think that the Mahdi, the, it's kind of like the Messiah figure in Islam will come uh, at, at the end of the world and the end of the world is very soon. They feel like any day, in fact, the great battle is going to take place at Dabiq in this little town where there actually was a battle just a, a couple weeks ago and it was taken over by the, by the Muslims and maybe think that's it. Maybe they think that's the beginning of the end. And this is the war with the Antichrist which is essentially the forces of uh, the Americans and the Europeans which is why they wanted so much for the Americans and Europeans to get involved in the war on the ground. It was the whole idea of the attack on Paris and the Vatican nightclub to try to get Hollande to proclaim as he did, this is war, but then even more so to send troops into the Middle East to fight in Syria where they could fight them on the ground and fulfill that prophecy. Unfortunately for them, fortunately for us, he didn't do that. 
he wasn't George Bush sending troops all the way across the world to fight a war that really invigorated the terrorists by fitting into their scenario of cosmic war in the end of times. Those people are still going to be around. This vision of cosmic war is still going to endure, but if they no longer have territory, if they have no longer have a viable path to creating an Islamic state, to fulfilling the caliphate, what's going to happen to them? Now we're kind of in this situation that Reza Aslan, who's a um, professor right here at Riverside, who teaches at Riverside, one of my former graduate students, uh, borrowed a term from me, the idea of a cosmic war in which people uh, battle, people are engaged in arguing, as I've also argued, that, that cosmic wars are kept alive by us, by responding to movements like this in a way that fulfill the prophetic role of the enemy, provide the war that fulfills the prophetic idea that they have about the end of time. But if we deny them that, if we deny them the enemy, if we deny them the, the, that prophetic war, uh, then what will happen? What will happen is what always happened to a little pop apocalyptic groups. They go back to their small little cells, muttering among themselves, drinking coffee, and plotting some future revenge, some future time. Uh, they'll just disappear as cosmic war becomes personal, and notions of struggle return to uh, myth and metaphor, and their audience has disappeared. Audience is so important to have the kind of support that's necessary to make viable these imaginary visions. Now, that brings up the subject of the most important audience, the one we already talked about, the Sunni Arabs. The ones who just accepted ISIS because they thought it was going to give them some respect. And sure enough, I mean, one of the stupidest things that the U.S. did with the invasion of Iraq was to disband Saddam's old army. And it was the largest army in the region, so suddenly you have thousands of soldiers with no place to go with no job. So they joined little militias, and so Iraq has been full of these small little militias back and forth. But finally, ISIS has given them a role, an army to be in. As the, the guy that I interviewed, the person that he knew, that was sold a car to, the used car dealer, uh, you know, he could actually get more money in the ISIS army than in the Iraq. For, moreover, as a Sunni, he got respect, which he didn't in the Iraq army because it was dominated by Shia. And the other were the administration, where the American policies refused to allow old Ba'ath Party officials, anybody who knew how to run anything in the country, to have their old jobs. Stupid idea. And this meant you have all these people who have these administrative capabilities. Well, when ISIS came to power, most of it was run fairly efficiently because all these people got jobs again. They had something they could do. So you have this Sunni Arab support after Mosul falls, my big question is, who's going to run Mosul? And what's going to happen to these people? Are they going to, is somebody going to be smart enough to know that they need to be empowered, that they need to have a role, they need to have what ISIS gave them, a little respect and a, and a, and a, and a job and something to do? Is that going to happen? Well, that's, that's the big question. Now, the optimal solution would be, I don't know how well, that well you can see this, but what I have on the board is, uh, the optimal solution would be if the, bag, if the, uh, the uh, Baghdad and Damascus governments accepted Sunni Arabs in some way, the old administrators, the old uh, soldiers, in a way that really gave them some respect and integrated them into the political system and were not simply dominantly Shia, uh, in the case of uh, Iraq, Alawite, which is a kind of Shia movement in the case of Syria, that's all really they need to really integrate them within the government. Is that going to happen? I don't know. A body kind of gets that point. Uh, interviews with a body says, seems to show that he understands. On the other hand, when he tried to change the, the Constitution to have more of a role for uh, Sunnis, uh, this, the green zone the, where he was holding this the parliament in, in Iraq was invaded by Shia militia who were supported by uh, Muqtada al-Sadr. They came marching in to break up the whole legislature. So, I mean, that's the kind of internal fight he has. He has a huge fight with his own Shia who've been, they like being in charge. They don't want these Sunnis to have any role. So, that's plan A. And I'm just telling you, plan A is difficult, integration. 
plan B, which is what I kind of like, is separation. And that goes back to the whole, the map, you know, at the end of the Ottoman Empire. If you look at this, it's a kind of crazy map, but you can see that the orange is Kurdish area, the blue is Sunni, and the green is Shia. And you can see that there is a kind of, if you redrew the nation state lines, you could create a Sunni state right in the middle. You could have, let, let uh, Bashar al-Assad have, and his um, Alawites have Western Syria right along the border, and you have uh, right on the coast, and you say, hey, that's not much left of Syria. Yeah, but that's where most of the population is, and where most of the money is. And also where most of the Christians and the Alawites are, the ones who are defending Bashar al-Assad. Then, the eastern Syria, which is mostly desert, can join with western Iraq, which is mostly desert, but populated by Sunni Arabs, with a new Sunni stand, or I don't know, call it something, but I'll call it Sunni stand for right now. Then you'd have the Shia state, which is the majority of Iraq down there, and the Kurds up in the north. They want to be independent. In fact, the Kurds already, when I flew into Erbil last year, instead of seeing a sign that said, welcome to Iraq, it said, welcome to Kurdistan. You know, they already think they're Kurdistan. So they're, they're ready to go. They don't, they would like Mosul to be a part of a Kurdish state. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this, this whole invasion of Mosul took months to prepare in advance and to get all, get the Peshmerga working with the Sunni uh, tribals and with the Iraq army, deal, I'm sure deals must have been made. And I'm kind of wondering what those deals were. And is the deal that Mosul will be a part of Kurdistan after the end of, after it becomes liberated? Or maybe it's the oil fields around Mosul or the dam, uh, the hydroelectric dam to the north. Part of that will go to Kurdistan. I think this. Personally, I think something must have been worked out. We'll see what happens after the after the fall of Mosul. Who gets what? That's my question. And whether the Sunnis are going to who are in uh, Mosul, whether they, whether they're going to feel like they get some sort of respect. And that's of course the Sunni tribals are involved in this. Uh, they're the fourth militia, so they must have been bought off some way. They must have been given some sort of promise. Something's going to happen. Well, that's another option. Quite realistically, I think it's going to be plan C. And plan C is if nothing happens. You always have to figure, uh, despite good plans and good options, one option is that people just won't be able to do anything. They'll be so at cross purposes, Russia, US, Iran in the background. So if nothing happens, and you continue to have a kind of failed state, both in uh, Syria and in Iraq, I think de facto you will have a kind of Sunni stand. If the uh, Sunni tribals are allowed to basically to come to power and to be the dominant force within that region, they will kind of de facto provide the leadership of a Sunni community uh, in the context of failed states of both Syria and Iraq. But the more Syria and Iraq try to impose their power over that region, the more trouble there will be, unless they're able to do it in a way that integrates the Sunni tribals. That's my prognosis for the region. And then what about the third ISIS? The third ISIS is these guys. These are the guys who, um, and they're usually guys, who are part of immigrant communities all over the world, uh, in Canada, the United States, Europe, um, North Africa, some of them, mostly of Arab background, but some of them are not. Some are, you know, Caucasian background. They just joined the movement. You've seen pictures of them. You know who they are. And by the way, take a good look at all these people in these pictures that I'm showing right now because they're all dead. They don't last very long. They're basically used as cannon fodder. Mac Benny is very cynical about it. Brings these people in, straps a suicide vest on them, throws them out in front of a, an army. Uh, in the meantime, he brings women in to kind of service them. They're supposedly married, but he makes sure that there's birth control so there are no kids because the marriages only last for a couple months because the guys only last for a couple months. And then a new guy comes in, a new marriage. Pretty soon the women get tired of this and they try to leave. The guys realize what's going on and they try to leave. But if you try to get try to leave, the punishment for trying to leave is pretty sudden, swift, and deadly. 
unless you can actually do it. And some actually do, they manage to escape. Uh, increasingly they do, and increasingly now that there is no longer territory that's a part of the caliphate, less people are coming, but part of the deal of having these spectacular attacks like the one of the Bataclan in, uh, in, um, in uh, uh, you know, the nightclub in, in Paris, it is to show that they got, there's power, that they're still playing the game, that, you know, for so people who might be looking on and reading to beat this magazine that is uh, online, uh, that is such a inspirational source, has interviews with people who are uh, young people who've joined the movement, and they tell how inspiring this is and how it's changed their lives. You know, for them, it, it, a show of power, like a terrorist attack in, in Paris or in Brussels or in Istanbul, uh, is a way of showing that the movement is still alive. Uh, so what if they've lost territory in uh, Raqqa or Mosul? Yeah, man, this is still big time. There's still a kick-ass war going on. We can still join the movement. I have some students who've been following Twitter accounts of uh, people who've joined the ISIS and who are part of this, the Bekia, the, they call it uh, uh, the family. It's the Arabic word for the family. You're part of the, Be the, the family, of the community of supporters. And some of them have actually gone to uh, Raqqa. In this case, it says, you can't read it from the back, it says, here I am, back from the Islamic State of Raqqa, in the back of a van, chilling and sipping coffee with my man. And it has flowers in his uh, AK-47, in case you didn't notice. Uh, and this guy um, says, Abdul Rabat in the front lines against the PKK, that's a Kurdish force. Never felt so hyped, this guy says. Uh, jihad is a great honor for man, so come and join Dawalaya Iqwa. The story of my life, a young boy raised in the U.S., dreams to be a basketball player, now under the Khalifa. You know, this is the kind of the spirit, the kind of radical adventure of, that so mesmerizing. You see how one of the young men who was uh, uh, probably in high school, uh, who we, we was contacted on, on the Twitter, we were following on Twitter, he said that his mother was about to take away his computer because she found out he was in contact with these uh, uh, ISIS extremists. He says, she can't do that. I have a way of getting around it because my life would be over. The only, I don't have any friends. I don't have family. I don't have any community. The only family I have is but the ISIS family. This is the only family I have. What a touching tragic story, but you can see how this imaginary war, this imaginary battle, can be so extraordinarily engrossing. This may continue. There may be more terrorist attacks, because it doesn't really need uh, territory. All it needs is the illusion of power to bring people into power, until there no longer really is even the ability to carry out attacks like this, and then, and then even in this case, the young people realize, oh, well, this is not working. <laughs> the war is over. The caliphate is not happening. But that may take some time. But in the meantime, um, the kind of critique of religion will continue. And this is my final comment about, uh, kind of sums up ISIS. It relates it to the work that I've been doing in general about the rise of religious violence around the world. It, it is, of course, a destructive thing, the forms of violence that we've seen. And yet, one of the interesting aspects of it is precisely the kind of critique that young people have brought to the political system. The critique that is part of the rise of the religious right and the politics of today in the United States, and that is uh, in an era of globalization, a kind of institutional framework that no longer has a soul, that no longer has a sense of community, that no longer has a sense of location. And this is this is where religious critiques can be so tremendously powerful. Because in an era of globalization, there really are three critical issues. The issues of identity, of accountability, and security. Who am I? The issue of identity. How can I, who's in charge? That's the issue of, a, of accountability. And how can I be safe? It's the issue of security. Globalization vastly undercuts that kind of certainty that allows people to have an a already built-in given sense of community, a national community, a national consensus, a national authority, a national sense of security. But religion 
has traditionally provided all of those things. If you're part of a religious community, you know who you are. You know who's in charge. You have a sense of authority. You can be secure. You have a sense of safety, a kind of harbor. So it's no surprise that in this moment of radical global social change, where people do feel alienated for a variety of reasons related to the phenomena of globalization, religion should appear, once again, not just as a supporter of destruction and violence, but as a harbinger of hope, of sending a message of peace that there is a way of thinking about uh, community and identity and accountability and authority uh, in, in ways that are, uh, are more secure than this this moment in history, and with like there will be, maybe not in religious forms, but uh, I don't think the nation state is an artifact that is forever going to be on the planet. We'll find other ways of organizing ourselves as, as communities in a way that give identity, a give accountability, give a sense of security uh, that no longer need radical movements of extraordinary change to challenge and disrupt them. And these have been my comments, and I appreciate you being very patient uh, audience, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I open up for questions from the audience, and I will come around with uh, the microphone, and we'll have to leave this up here. Okay. Hi, um, I just finished reading a book by a guy by the name of Andrew Basvick, who's a military historian, and the book is called uh, America's War for the Greater Middle East. And he, as I recall, he starts off by saying, our interest in the Middle East, it goes back to Jimmy Carter in 1980, but our interest in the Middle East was primarily originally a Cold War phenomenon, and it morphed into trying to be um, uh, builder of nation states, uh, and finally it's now evolved into, devolved, I should say, into just um, trying to restore order and stability. And he says the reason that we're there, which I essentially do agree with, is because we can be, because we perceive ourselves as, as uh, the biggest superpower, and we could do everything with the military, and had no ability to anticipate any of these other cross currents in these societies. Um, what do you think of this? Well, Andrew Bashman is a great guy. I, I know him personally. He's a remarkable fellow. Not only is he a skillful political observer and a military historian, he has a personal stake in this. His own son was killed in the war in Iraq. And he has, you know, it, it gives him a kind of passion about uh, the kind of the futility of American exercise of power around the world that uh, uh, is really very, uh, um, very winning and very uh, appealing. Uh, Andrew also had an earlier essay when we talked about uh, the war on terror being World War IV, uh, a new effort to try to reconceive or reconstruct uh, the world in America's image. And like the other three wars, it always was an unfinished promise that you could win the war, but you never, re never really won the vision. You never really transformed uh, the the world of the way America wanted it to, to be. Um, so, uh, yeah, so essentially, I'm I'm on his wavelength. I see that this is a kind of troubled effort, uh, and one that uh, one that has uh, a, a lot of um, uh, you know, presumptuousness, a grandiose notion of Amer about America's role, but also contained with it. And I think you see this in Obama rather than Bush a sense of responsibility as the lone superpower. We do have uh, a responsibility to try to maintain some sense of order, particularly in those areas of the world where we've disrupted the order. And we've, we're the ones who created the mess in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we do have a responsibility to try to do something uh, to make it possible for those people to go on and reconstruct their lives uh, in a positive way without simply abandoning them. So, uh, yeah, I agree with that.
thank you for this. This is uh, very fascinating. I was just hoping that you could uh, speak to the fact that uh, several journalists and scholars have uh, noticed, like Ben Swan and Nafiz Ahmed and others, that uh, note that the United States has been providing all kinds of support for the FSA. And a lot of that material support and you know, weapons and other things end up in the hands of ISIS. And also the fact that when we left Iraq that we ne didn't take any of our military equipment. And there ended up, ISIS went in, grabbed all the tanks and other things and posted pictures online and other things like that. So I was just hoping to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> And, you know, people say, well, where did ISIS get all of its stuff? Uh, well, one was that, you know, it just got, the, it robbed the piggy bank when it got into Mosul, which is, you know, the second largest city in, in Iraq. It just moved into the bank and it said, oh, free money, you know, and then suddenly it had a lot of money, but it also had these caches of weapons, which the Americans left behind, presumably, for the Iraq army. But when this area then fell into ISIS control. These caches of weapons, of course, fell into ISIS hands. And then the third source of support, of, um, of monetary support, came from oil, uh, being able to sell, sell oil uh, illegally, the tankers that went into Turkey. Uh, people have asked the, the sometimes why the U.S. knowing that they could, you could see satellite imagery of these tankers going to Turkey why they just didn't destroy the tankers. And part of the problem was that the people who, the drivers of the tankers were just ordinary Sunnis. You would kill them in the process. And the Americans uh, had uh, some reservation about, about, despite what you may have heard about drone strikes, uh, you know, knowing that you would be killing some of the civilians was not something they were willing to do. But having said that, they were able to disrupt, they were destroying the refineries, the supply lines, the roads themselves. Um, the biggest problem was Turkey, because Turkey was uh, kind of, on one hand, opposed to ISIS, on the other hand, turning a blind eye to this great, this lucrative source of income through uh, from oil that was being sold through Turkey to Turkey and through Turkey. Um, but these lines now have been cut off, and this no longer. Plus, the you know the oil, the international cost of oil has gone down so much that this has uh, affected the income of ISIS. Uh, by the way, the thousands of dollars a month that they used to offer, they no longer offer to their soldiers. It went down to 500, now I understand it's down to 200 dollars. So they're feeling the pinch, economic pinch as well. Oh, we have a question up here also. You had a question, right? So today we had a uh, session on militias and militaries and police, and you said respect today. That, you know, I get respect now. As soon as you get respect now, yeah. And it, this is a, a common theme that I'm hearing in anything that deals with war. That one of the main drivers is you will respect me, and um, and I raised the comment that someone out there on the net, it was a meme I saw, had said that you know there's two kinds of respect. There's you will respect me as a human being. And then there's you will respect me as an authority. And um, we had someone give an example of you know people walking in open carry with you know a rifle through a Walmart just because they could in right. open carry states to show that they had power to show that they weren't going to take other people telling them that they couldn't carry their gun in a public place. And to me, that's more the you will respect me as an authority. And to me, that kind of connotes you'll respect me because you're afraid of me and I can hurt you. And what I'm wondering is, what kind of respect do you think the Sunni generally are trying to, to gain? Are they trying to get, you'll respect me as a human being, or you'll respect me because I can hurt you if you don't? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I, somehow it seems to me the two are linked more closely than you imply. Because uh, in the case of the Shia, yeah, if the, if the Shia uh, government in, in Baghdad really opened itself up to the Sunnis to involve them in the, in the government. This would mean not only getting the Sunnis, Sunnis to respect, respect their, their political authority, but they would ex respect their political authority if they felt that the Shia respected them as persons, you know, if you respected them as a community, as people who should have equal rights, should have equal uh, authority. So I don't know, to my mind, those two forms of respect are not it's certainly not antithetical, and maybe not as different as, as we might think.
Have we worn ourselves out? I think we're hungry. <laughs> oh, we had a question here. I'm sorry. In your story about the man who thought that the United States was there because Saddam Hussein was a puppet and about to fall, um, you, you said, I'm beginning to wonder if there was something to that. Um, what do you think our motivations are now in that part of the world as a country? It seems that they've been very confused. Now or at the, or at the time during the Bush administration? Because I think during the Bush administration there really was um, a kind of fear of a clash of civilizations, uh, of the Muslim world kind of encroaching and, and this whole glossing over the Al-Qaeda, the differences between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein, which are night and day. I mean, you know, Al-Qaeda is a religious organization, or one that claims religiosity, and, and then you have the secular socialist of Saddam Hussein, and yet they were, they were all kind of glossed over. They're glossed over by Fox News. They were glossed over in Cheney's uh, assertion that there was a connection, uh, and also glossed over the, in, the, in the public mind. You know, when that statue fell of Saddam Hussein in, in Purdue Square in, in, uh, in, in uh, Baghdad, uh, right before it fell, a young Marine climbed up and put an American flag over the head of Saddam Hussein, kind of like a, a hood, you know, an executioner's hood. And then immediately the military said, take it down. We don't want this to be an American thing. We've got all these Kurds in the background as photo op, you know, and we don't even want to see the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the crane that's pulling over the machine, and you know, the picture you can see the line for the crane, but that wasn't supposed to be in the picture. It was supposed to be the Iraqi people are pulling down the, the, the thing. And, and there was a reporter from uh, Reuters who had the, the common sense to go in to that uh, soldier and said, why, why did you put that thing up there? And he says, well, well he says, this is, a, this is not an ordinary flag. This was a flag that flew over the Pentagon in 9-11. And I want to show that we're getting even. And the Reuters reporter said, well, you know that Saddam Hussein had no connection with Al-Qaeda, had no connection with 9-11, don't you? And the soldier said, yeah, well, maybe you're right. But still, in my heart, I think we're getting even. OK? <laughs> so this kind of illusion that those people out there, there's this kind of amorphous Muslim hostility towards America and everything gets kind of glossed together. I think that was a real, you know, real sentiment. The BBC uh, it's a program called uh, uh, Power of Nightmares uh, very nicely articulates the, the imagined war on the Al-Qaeda side and comparing it with the imagined war of the neocon side and they're remarkably similar. I mean both are kind of imagined threats from a dark, inchoate, you know, mysterious enemy that's out to get them. And both are, of course, imagined enemies and imagined wars. <laughs> so I, I think, in that sense, they're right they're at, at that time. But one of the first things that happened under the Obama administration was the term "war on, on terror" was tossed out. So we, we, this is we're not in an endless war on terror. What does it mean to be in a war on terror? That's a device. It's not an enemy, you know. So that was tossed out, and then a tempo was tried to reframe. You know, it went to. Went to Cairo and gave a speech trying to re reframe the, re the relationship with the Muslim world, which I think made people accept it and, and appreciate it. And, and certainly the attitude to, towards America did change vastly, which is why he received the Peace Prize from the Nobel Peace Prize. It was a genuine sense that he was trying to reshape uh, that whole uh, image. Uh, but nonetheless, as I said, there is this sense of lingering responsibility of, of the United States. That in a region where we screwed things up, you know, we have some responsibility to try to do something. And I do think that's been the honest motivation uh, for Obama ever since, even though some of the tactics, like the drone tactics, I think have been very troubling because they really created such hostility against America. The anti-Americanism in Pakistan is just off the road. I follow the Pakistan newspapers. Uh, and, and whenever there's a drone strike, maybe it's on page 20 of the New York Times, but it's all over the front page of the Dawn, which is the Karachi's largest newspaper or some other paper in Pakistan. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's been a very troubling aspect of our presence there. So is that it, Tim? Other questions?
Good. I was uh, just hoping you could maybe connect two things that you mentioned more explicitly because you talked well here in the slide that's on the screen right now. You're talking about how globalization has created a lot of economic insecurity for people in the Middle East, yeah. um, and that that feeds this problem. In and the that middle, middle East, what about Middle America? Well, yes, uh, yes but we're at these elections. Right, of yeah. course. I'm completely on the same page with that. Yeah. Um, and then you also mentioned that, however, if we fight them, literally fight them, we fulfill a prophecy, and that doesn't help either. Right. In a perfect world, which we don't live in, but ideally, what is there any kind of leverage that countries have to help the situation, uh, or is it really just up to the people of the countries of Syria and Iraq? What countries have leverage? Uh, help me understand what's... I'm asking you. I, I don't know. I'm asking if there was anything that the global community could do. Oh, to change the situation. Right, to make it conducive to, for example, the integration model that you talked about. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, if my first, uh, the first thing I would do in terms of any uh, kind of movement of terrorism is, is for to counsel our leaders to not act like the enemy that they say that we are. That is, to not to, to, fill, to fit into the narrative of cosmic war, to become that evil enemy. Uh, which means instead of militarizing uh, a conflict, criminalizing it. That is, if there is a terrorist attack, whether it's in Orlando, Florida, or, or the Bataclan in Paris, I mean, these are attack on killing people in an attack is it's against the law. I mean, it's murder. It's, uh, we've got laws against that, you know. And you can find people and you can bring them to justice and you can have what they did for the, you know, long before 9-11, there was a 1993 attack on the World Trade Center. Same people, same cast of characters. They were all related. I interviewed people uh, who were involved in the 1993 attack but because I could. They went on trial in Manhattan, in New York City, and then they received life sentences. And the guy I talked with, Mahmoud Abulema, was in the Lompoc Federal Penitentiary, where he's been for a long time. And, and they, they are directly connected. Uh, uh, Ramzi Youssef, one of the guys involved in this, is, a, is the nephew of colleague Sheikh Mohammed, who's the central guy in the 9-11 attack, who the 9-11 Commission says was the, the chief plotter, not Osama bin Laden, I know. You think Osama bin Laden was behind 9-11. I still don't know, and I study these things, what his connection was. Because clearly, colleague Sheikh Mohammed was behind the whole thing in terms of the organization. And it was unfinished business for 1993. But we responded in 1993 totally differently. It was a criminal act. We found the guys. They went on trial. They served them. They're in prison. In 9-11, suddenly it's war. And we're declaring war on the Muslim world, <laughs> invading and occupying two Muslim countries, and, and imagining ourselves in a cosmic war and terror that is threatening the whole of civilization. Well, we're creating the very problem that, that uh, we're trying to, uh, trying to deal with. So the way the US responds, the way governments respond, I think, vastly changes the whole equation. It changes the whole character of, of the Conflict. I know that's not exactly responding to what you were saying, but I think uh, the, the kind of pressure and the kind of concerns that we as citizens can raise and bring to our government would make, does make a difference. I have to tell you, I was talking blue in the face right after 9-11. I was on talk shows, all because I had written uh, this book, Terror in the Mind of God. It was already out in, in the Rolodex of producers, so I was called by Fox News. Fox News! Before the second tower came down, I was on Fox News and on CNN, on BBC, and, and I had a, a response, an opportunity, but also a responsibility to say, hey, we're not fighting the whole Muslim world. This is a small bunch of people. We should narrow our focus to them and bring them to justice. But that's a hard sell when you've got this agitation and you've got the whole, the hype that comes with the agitation. But this time supported by the media, not just Fox News, but the same logo, War and Terror, was on CNN, and of course the power of the presidency and the administration was behind it. That's a very tough, that's a very tough uh, kind of thing to stand up against. And there was only one congresswoman from my old district in Berkeley <laughs> who actually uh, stood up against the, initially the, the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, uh, which I think 
was also a mistake, uh, just as certainly Iraq was. So we were two mistaken operations that have continued to compound and trouble us ever since. But, and American public could have made a difference at those critical moments. But we didn't. So we're sad. Let's not let that happen again. <laughs> Regardless of who becomes elected president in the next coming days. Well, thank you all for being very patient and tolerant. And I thank you. Thank you. To get your food, uh, go out this door, and there is a tavern, Glenwood Tavern, just to your right. And go through that, and then you'll come out this door and come back in here to our tea. And they're ready for us now.